Okay. So today we're going to start unit 12. We will do the first lesson this week, and then when you get back from spring break, we will finish the unit. Okay. So this week, you are going to have a quiz at the end. So probably what I'm going to do is you will have it Thursday in class. Friday will probably be a free day because I know most of you probably won't even be here, especially a period. I'm sure a lot of you will get signed out. So we will have the quiz on Thursday. If you are not going to be here for the quiz at all, for some reason you won't be here Thursday or Friday, then I will have the quiz online. So. You can take the quiz in class on Friday, or you can take the quiz online before you go to spring break. I really don't care as long as it gets done, okay? If you take it online, the quiz will close Saturday night, sun, sorry, Sunday night at midnight. So you have until the end of the weekend to take the quiz. So as long as you take it before you go off to spring break, then everything is fine, okay? Um, when you come back from spring break, please realize that that week is the last week of the third quarter. So that Friday, the 26th, I believe, is the last day of the quarter. So I know for a lot of your teachers, that is the cutoff. Anything after that is not accepted. That is their deadline because that is the end of the quarter. So when you get back from spring break, please be aware of that and please make sure that everything is up to date and you're getting caught up. You're making up stuff if you need to. You're keeping up with your work. Okay, the end of the quarter is the Friday after spring break. Okay, um, that being said, you know me, I always wait until when grades are due. So I know grades are always due, I think like a week, a week and a half after the quarter technically ends. So if you have anything for me that you need to make up for quarter three, then you have a little bit more time. But when you get back from spring break, Please realize that it is crunch time and that the quarter, the quarter is quickly coming around the corner. Anyway, um, okay, so let's get this over with. So that we can okay, so lesson one, the gas laws. Before we learn about the gas laws, we have to know about the different SI units and how to convert between them or to convert between the SI units and similar units of those. Oh, that looks like fun. It is. All right. So you have in this chapter or in this unit, whatever you want to call it, we are going to study the relationship between pressure, volume, temperature. And then at the very end, we're going to go back to looking at our number of particles and our number of grams. So we're going to look at our molar, our molar mass and our Avogadro's number. Um, yes. Okay. So, I'm sorry. My brain is done for today. Okay. So, what you need to know. Okay. Your formula sheet. Is that what you're talking about? Like what's given to you? When, Anyway, I just didn't know what I have to write. Okay, so your formula sheet will have all of this on it. Oh. Or if it doesn't, then it's, it's probably like this, where it's a thousand milliliters are in one liter because the prefix milli means a thousand. That's going back to unit one. So you have to remember your conversions and how you convert from unit one. But this is on your formula sheet, so this will be given to you. This is on your formula sheet, so this will be given to you. And then this, this is given to you. This is not, but remember, molar mass, you know, you should all know how to find the molar mass. Okay? So, you don't have to write it down, so you don't have to know the numbers, but you do need to know how to use them and convert from one to the other. So, your pressure, your SI unit, Oh, I would probably write down what the SI unit is. So the SI unit is PA, which is Pascal. That I would write down. Everything underneath, I, I wouldn't. But anyway, the SI unit for pressure is the Pascal. It is abbreviated PA. So Pascal is the SI unit. Remember, SI unit is just the same unit that everyone is going to use regardless of where you live on Earth. So everyone around the Earth will automatically use Pascal 
for their unit of pressure. But you need to know how to convert between the different units of pressure. So we have the kilopascal, which there are 1,000 pascals in one kilopascal, because the prefix kilo means 1,000. You need to know how to convert between the kilopascals and ATM. So that's that number. You also have a unit called tor, and that's how you would convert to tor. And you also have a unit called millimeters of mercury, or MMHG, and that's how you would convert. So these four are all given to you on your formula sheet. So you don't need to know the number, but you need to know how to convert using those numbers. But you do need to know that the Pascal is the SI unit for pressure. You also need to know that the liter, so capital L, is the SI unit for volume. And you do need to know how to convert between liters and milliliters. So you would either multiply by a thousand or divide by a thousand, whichever situation presents itself. And then finally, temperature. Our SI unit for temperature is called the Kelvin. So not degrees Kelvin, just Kelvin. So what you're going to be having to do is you're going to be given a lot of your temperatures in degrees Celsius. You need to know how to convert between degrees Celsius and Kelvin. So that is the formula. It is given to you on your formula sheet, so you don't have to memorize how to do it. But it's very simple. All you have to do is add 273 to your degrees Celsius. That's it. So make sure you know your SI units. Make sure you are comfortable converting between units. If I give you the number, make sure you know how to convert between them. All right, so our first law is called Boyle's Law because Robert Boyle came up with it. Robert Boyle is known as the father of chemistry and he came up with Boyle's Law. Boyle's Law is the relationship between pressure and volume. So all of these problems, all of your problems with your gas laws are going to be scenarios or situations or events. So they're all going to be word problems. Okay, so what you're going to have is you're going to have a bunch of words thrown at you with a bunch of numbers put in periodically. And you're going to have this formula, two other formulas. You're going to use your formula, you're going to pull out the numbers that you need, and you're going to solve for the unknown. So it's going to give you three out of the four numbers, and you have to solve for the unknown. So depending on how good you are or were at algebra. Oh my God. <laughs> Oh, this, this unit may be easy if you were good at algebra. If you were not good at algebra, then you need to spend a little bit more time studying and doing practice problems for this unit. Because it is a lot of algebra. It is a lot of solving for the I unknown. Hate math. I hate math. I'm sorry. All right. Uh, I mean, you could not, but then that's your grade, so not mine. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so what this relationship tells you, so if you have everything on one line, if you have P1V1 equals P2V2, what this is telling you is that these two things are inversely proportional. And what that means is that if one thing is doing something, the other thing is doing the opposite of it. So if one thing is increasing, the other one is decreasing. If one is decreasing, then the other one is increasing. So if one is doing one thing, the other thing is doing the opposite of that thing. So that's what it means by inversely proportional. They will do the inverse of each other. So let's do an example of Boyle's Law. So, again, all of these problems are going to be word problems, and they're going to give you all of your numbers but one, and you have to solve for the unknown. 
So a bottle at one ATM has a volume of two liters. If this bottle was taken underwater to a pressure of five ATM, what would the volume of the bottle be? So what you have to realize is that there is some event happening. There's some scenario happening and you have conditions before that event and you have conditions after that event. And one of those conditions is gonna be the one that you have to solve for. So if I have Boyle's law, that means that I have an initial pressure and initial volume. So I have my P1 and my V1. I have some event happening. After that event, I now have two new values for my P1 and my V2. So you have your ones and your twos. So for the first few times that you do these problems, if you are having difficulties picking out which is the one and which is, which is your number one and which is your number two, then I suggest what you do is draw a little picture of the event that's happening and then figure out what is happening before that event, what is happening after that event. So what is my event that's happening? Well, I have a bottle, I have a water bottle. And my water bottle is being taken underwater. Okay, so that's my event. So what are my conditions before that event? And what are my conditions after that event? So what was my pressure before the water bottle went underwater? Yes, Connor. Huh? One ATM is my P1 because ATM is a unit of pressure. What was my volume before the water bottle went underwater? Two liters because liters is a unit of volume. So those are my conditions before the event. My event happened and now all the numbers after that event are for my P2 and V2 numbers. Well, they only give me one number, which is five ATM. Is five ATM a unit of pressure or a unit of volume? Pressure, so it would be my P2. So five ATM would go here. My V2 is the unknown. That is the one that I'm going to solve for. So now that I have my three out of the four numbers, I plug those numbers into my formula and I solve for the unknown. So P1 over, no, P1 times V1 equals P2 times V2. So my P1 is my one ATM. My V1 is my two liters. My P2 is my five ATM. And my V2 is my unknown. So how would I solve for my V2? What would I do? I have to get this by itself. So I have to divide by five ATM. Whatever I do on one side, I have to do on the other side. So I have to divide by five ATM on both sides. When I do that, my five ATM goes away on this side. I am left with my number for my V2. My units of ATM are gonna go away on this side. My units of liters are the only thing that's left. And then I just do the math. So one times two divided by five, which is 0.4. So my answer would be 0.4 liters. All right, so there are ways, guys, there are ways that you can check your answer. If your answer does not make sense, then your answer is wrong. What I mean by making sense is we know that there is a relationship between these two things, pressure and volume. If pressure does one thing, what is the volume going to do? The opposite. So what is happening to my pressure? My pressure is increasing. So what should happen to my volume? My volume should decrease. So my volume should be lower or smaller than two. Is my answer smaller than two? Yes. Yes, so then I know that I did it correctly and I have the correct answer. So make sure that you're checking yourself. Make sure that your answer makes sense. Make sure it follows the relationship of the two things. Any questions on Boyle's Law? Yes, sir.
1 times 2 divided by 5. So 2 divided by 5. Your second law is called Charles's law, and Charles's law is going to be the relationship between volume and temperature. Charles's law is between volume and temperature. So one, your V1 and your V2 are on the top, your T1 and your T2 are on the bottom. So these are said to be directly proportional to each other. And if they are directly proportional to each other, then what one thing does, the other thing will do the exact same. So in this case, if your volume is increasing, your temperature is increasing. If your volume is decreasing, then your temperature is decreasing. If your temperature is increasing, then your volume is increasing. And if your temperature is decreasing, then your volume is decreasing. What one thing does, the other thing will do the exact same. The thing now that you have to be careful of is that your units of temperature have to be in Kelvin. You cannot use degrees Celsius numbers. Your temperature has to be in Kelvin. Has to. You cannot put in degrees Celsius in this formula. Yes, sir. Yes. They have to be Kelvin. So we have to know how to convert between degrees Celsius and Kelvin. Again, not degrees Kelvin, just Kelvin. So how do we convert between degrees Celsius and Kelvin? Well, all we have to do is use this formula. This formula is given to you on your formula sheet. But if you notice, if I give you a temperature in degrees Celsius, so if I give you 25 degrees Celsius, and I need you to convert that into Kelvin, what are you going to do to that number? Add 272. You're going to add 273. So if I want you to convert 25 degrees Celsius into Kelvin, you would just add 273. And what would your new number be? Mm -hmm. Yes, 298 Kelvin. Not degrees Kelvin, just Kelvin by itself. The trickier part may be going the other way around. So let's say I give you 219 Kelvin and I ask you to convert that into degrees Celsius. How would you convert from Kelvin to degrees Celsius? So if you use this formula and you plug in this number here, you would have 219 Kelvin equal to degrees Celsius plus 273. You're solving for degrees Celsius, so what would you do to this number? Subtract it. So minus 273 on both sides. And that would give you your answer in degrees Celsius, whatever it is. Thank you. Negative 54? Negative 54. So if you are going from degrees Celsius to Kelvin, you simply just add 273. If you do a problem and you get your answer in Kelvin, but all of your answer choices on your test or your quiz are in degrees Celsius, then you would have to convert your Kelvin back into degrees Celsius. If that's the case, then you just subtract 273. So you're either adding 273 or you're subtracting 273, depending on which one you're going from and which one you're going to. Okay? Easy. All right. So 
So let's do an example with Charles's law. So again, we have another word problem. They're all going to be word problems. Okay. An empty water bottle with a volume of 500 milliliters at 25 degrees Celsius is left in a car during the day. The temperature rises to 40 degrees Celsius. What is the new volume of the bottle? So our event is that we have a empty bottle but it is not empty of gases so we are measuring the gases inside the bottle the air in the bottle okay so we're doing charles's law so we have volume so v1 and t1 volume and temperature we have an initial volume and temperature and then we have a final volume and temperature so now we need to figure out which one is for what? So what is my V1? What is the volume before my event happens? Well, that's 500. That is 500 milliliters, which is this one. Yeah. What is the temperature before my event? 25 Celsius. 25 degrees Celsius. So then, that is my bottle. I put it into my car. It sits in the car all day, and the sun is going to heat up the bottle. Yeah. So what is my V2? 40 Celsius. My V2 is 40 degrees Celsius? No, so am I, so I'm that's solving unknown. for V2, right? And then what is my T2? 40 Celsius. 4 degrees Celsius. All right. So can I just take those numbers and plug them straight into my formula? Yeah. What do I have to do? I have to convert my temperatures into Kelvin. How do I go from degrees Celsius to Kelvin? I add 273. So what is my new T1? 298. What is my new T2? What is it? I think it's 313. I think so. Yeah, it is. Alright, so there's your new T1 and your new T2. So now you can take those numbers and plug them in. So you have V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. So it is 500 milliliters divided by 298 Kelvin equal to your V2 is what you're solving for divided by your 313 Kelvin. Now you have stuff on the top and on the bottom. How are you going to solve for V2? Yes, Maria, that's what we're going to say. Yes, cross multiply. So V2 times 298 Kelvin equal to 500 milliliters times 313 Kelvin. Yes, Leo. Yes. Now, what would I do in order to solve for V2? Oh, you'd add or multiply it to the bottom. <laughs> okay, so if this, if this is attached to this, mm -hmm. these two are being multiplied together, right? Yeah. In order to get this by itself, I have to do the opposite. Yeah. So I'm going to do what? Divide. divide. So I'm going to divide by 298 Kelvin on both sides. So that means that my 298 Kelvin goes away on this side, my units of Kelvin go away on this side, and I have V2 equal to 500 times 313 divided by 298. Which is what? 525.2. Yeah. Wait, how do you? Milliliters. What? Oh, so it's, it's 500 times 313 divided by 298. And then because my units of Kelvin cancel out, my units that are left over are my milliliters. So I have 525.2 milliliters left over. So now I want to check my answer. So what is the relationship between volume and temperature? If one is doing one thing, the other is doing what? The same thing. The same thing. So what is happening to my temperature? My temperature is increasing, so my volume should also what? Increase. So I'm looking for a number that's larger than 500. Is my answer larger than 500? Yes. yes, so I know that my answer is correct. Or I know that I did it correctly. 
Now, what if all of your answers are in liters? You're going to have to convert this into liters. How would you convert this into liters? So you have to figure out, are you going to multiply by 1,000 or divide by 1,000? Well, if you have 525.2 milliliters, and if you do the picket fence, what has to go diagonal? Oh, yeah, yeah. Milliliters. So are you going to multiply or divide by a thousand? Divide by a thousand. So then you would have 0 0.53 liters. So you need to know how to convert between milliliters and liters, between degrees Celsius and Kelvin, between a kilopascal and a regular pascal. Because the prefix kilo means what? A thousand. So there are a thousand pascals and one kilo pascal. So you have to know how to convert between units. A good way to do that is the picket fence because it tells you if you have to multiply or divide. Any questions on Charles's law? All right. Last law is Gay-Lussac's law. Gay-Lussac's law is the relationship between pressure and temperature. So these are also going to be one over the other. So these are also going to have a directly proportional relationship. That means that whatever one is doing, the other one is doing the exact same. So if pressure is increasing, then your temperature is increasing. If your temperature is increasing, then your pressure is increasing. If your pressure is decreasing, then your temperature is decreasing. If your temperature is decreasing, then your pressure is decreasing. Whatever one does, the other one does the exact same thing. You also need to make sure that for this one, your temperatures are also in Kelvin. So you need to add 273. If I give you numbers in degrees Celsius, you need to add 273 to both of them to turn them into kelvins. So, do an example of Gay Lussac's law, and then we are done for today. Yay. Right now. So, a basketball has an internal pressure of 500 kPa at 25 degrees Celsius. What would the pressure be if the temperature was raised to 65 degrees Celsius? So, we have our event happening, and we have a basketball. And before that basketball undergoes that event, we have a certain pressure, so P1. And we have a certain temperature, so T1. So we have P1 and T1 before the event, and then we have P2 and T2 after the event. So now we need to figure out what our numbers are and where do they go. We have 500 kPa, 25 degrees Celsius, and 65 degrees Celsius. So it's telling me that my basketball, my temperature was raised. So let's pretend like I have a little heat source here and my temperature is being raised, okay? So what was my initial pressure? So before the temperature was raised, what was the pressure initially? KPA. My KPA, which is 500 KPA. No. What was my initial temperature? 25 degrees Celsius. What was my final pressure? 
That's where my question mark is. What is my final temperature? 65 degrees Celsius. What do I have to do before I can plug those numbers into my formula? 273. So what is my... That's 298 and... And what? All right, so now I can plug those in. So now I have my P1 over my T1 equals my P2 over my T2. So that's 500 kPa divided by 298 Kelvin equal to P2 is my unknown. 338 Kelvin is on the bottom. Now, according to my relationship, what is happening to my, so what's happening to my temperature? It's increasing. So according to my relationship, what should my pressure do? It should also increase. So I'm going to look for a number that is larger than 500. So I'm going to cross multiply and solve for P2. So P2 times five, nope. P2 times 298 Kelvin equal to 500 kPa times 338 Kelvin. And then how do I solve for P2? How do I solve for this? Divide by 298 on both sides. So my 298 is gonna go away. My units of Kelvin are gonna go away. So my P2 is what? 567.14. KPA, because I did 500 times 338 divided by 298. Okay, so you just cancel out the K? Yep. Because you have one on top, one on the bottom. I mean, you just have to get over to I mean, you can. So then you would do 567.1 kilopascals. You'd have one kilopascal on the bottom. 1,000 pascals on the top, so then you have 5, 6, 7, pascals, so yeah, you could if, if, if your answer choices were all in Pascal's, then yes, you would do that. Yes. What? No, it's not. No one cares, Will. You would do, so your decimal point is right here. Oh, thanks. And then you move it over three times. And then you move it over three times. Thank you. Have a nice day. You too. Bye, Dad. So, did I do it right or did I do it wrong? Oh. Oh, she knows. Don't say that. All right. So, tomorrow you will do practice worksheets. Your quiz is on Thursday. Friday will be a free day, and then you have spring break. Woo!